Today we're going to take a look at the archaeological, no, the archaeology study Bible. Not to be confused with the archaeological study Bible, which we've reviewed in another video, so go check that one out if you missed it. But rather, this is the archaeology study Bible by Crossway. Now, first thing to note, the archaeology study Bible has decided to one-up the Net Bible Full Notes edition in the category of most useless dust jacket ever. Literally, guys. Really? It does look cool, though. I gotta admit. But for the sake of the review, we're gonna do it on natural. Now, this is obviously the hardcover edition. It also comes in leather. It is 2000. 23 pages with 15 pages of full color maps in the back. It is double columned and the cross references rather than being in the middle are actually down at the bottom. It's a little awkward when translations that put them down at the bottom. We've seen a few others that do that as well. I guess it saves space, but you're not going to get a lot of room to take notes on the pages. They've pretty much left just a tiny margin on the side, nothing really on the interior. So if you write in your Bible, if you're one of those people, this is going to be tricky once you practice your micro handwriting. This is meant to accompany the ESV study Bible, which we have reviewed here, as well as the ESV Bible Atlas. So those three things together are meant to be, I think in the words of the introduction, a kind of suite. That is, they comprise a set of related studies. It is a collection that provides a strong and well-rounded introduction to the study of the Bible. So that's an important thing to note because one of the things that I'll comment on later is the scope of the notes in this study Bible. You notice it's not the thickest study Bible, especially for one that contains so many pictures which this Bible does, tons of pictures. All the pages are full color, and it probably has as many photographs as any study Bible that I've ever seen. They also, in the introduction, say that this study Bible is done all by working archaeologists, those who've had their hands dirty, so to speak, but they intentionally said they want to avoid pop archaeology. Now, what's pop archaeology? Well, anytime you hear someone claim that they've found Noah's Ark or that science or archaeology has proved this or that story of the Bible, usually nine times out of ten, that's going to be a case of pop archaeology. That's going to be something where a self-styled wannabe adventurer went out into the desert and discovered something that's groundbreaking, that's going to convert all the atheists in the world, and yada, yada, yada. That kind of stuff, it sells a lot. It's popular among Christians because we want to hear things that validate our faith, but it's rarely received in the actual archaeological community, and usually it's going to be about as unreliable as it is sensational. So take that for what it's worth. They do a good job, the Archaeology Study Bible, in avoiding that type of thing. Now the book intros for each book of the Bible are very short. They're only one to two pages tops. Rather than giving kind of an overview of the book and its interpretations and the themes and all that kind of stuff, very quick introduction and then the section on how archaeology has affected the interpretation or the reading of that particular book. Now some of the noted contributors, most are, like we said earlier, they either done archaeological work themselves or overseen archaeological projects and there are a number of them but some that may stick out to you are Barry Betzel, 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 John Currid, Richard Hess, Catherine McDowell, I actually know her, she's a great scholar, Boyd Seavers, Mark Wilson, and Paul Wright. And there are biographical sketches of each contributor. So it tells you kind of what their qualifications are, why they are included in this volume, which is nice. Usually you just get a list of contributors, sometimes where they studied or where they teach. This one actually tells you a little bit about each contributor. I really like that. I wish more study Bibles would incorporate that, honestly. After the introduction to the ESV itself, there are a series of essays. The first one is, What is Archaeology? by John Currid. It's a really good overview, just introducing people who may not be as familiar with archaeology or may only know about it from Indiana Jones or MacGyver or whatever. It's MacGyver. He did some art. Yeah, he found the Holy Grail in that one episode that they ripped off from Indiana Jones. Anyway, a lot of people get their ideas of archaeologists from Hollywood and from popular presentations. So there's a good overview at the beginning about what it is, what the discipline consists of. And you see that consistently throughout this study Bible. A lot of notes, a lot of sidebar articles, 
a lot of essays about the discipline and what goes into the discipline of archaeology, how they can date certain things, how they can tell what layer is from what period. It, it really does drill down into the nuts and bolts more than any other study Bible I've seen, even more than the archaeological study Bible from Zondervan. Then there's an essay on the 10 most significant discoveries in the field of biblical archaeology. This gives a short section about some things that you may have heard of, but you just may not be familiar with. Rosetta Stone, Dead Sea Scrolls, the Tel Dan inscription, the Moabite Stone, the Lachish Letters, the Epic of Gilgamesh, Hezekiah's Tunnel, the Crucified Man at Givat Hamivtar. Very important discoveries in the field of archeology span and why they matter in our study of scripture. Then comes a list of a lot of relevant texts and inscriptions from the ancient world, and then a good three, four page essay on the daily life of ancient Israelites. This helps you wrap your mind around the seasonal cyclical nature that dominated the life of ancient Israel. It also has a map that shows what the different areas of the region specialized in. Things like honey, cattle, textiles, perfume, sheep, metalworking. Again, really helpful for rooting the world of the Bible in actual ancient history. And then there's a very condensed Old Testament timeline, just one page before the actual Old Testament itself begins. At the end of the Bible, there are another series of essays, just as in-depth, a lot of pictures. It starts with doing archaeology, which discusses just how a dig works and, and gives you some background that a lot of people don't know in terms of how exactly they excavate these sites. Again, lots of pictures. This Bible is really trying to pull back the curtain and show you how the sausage gets made in terms of biblical archaeology. There's next an article called Archaeology as an Academic Discipline. There's one on, I really like this article, Expository Preaching and Archaeology. This is written for preachers and it's meant to say, look, you guys are preaching this text. So if you're just giving boring facts that don't do anything to focus the listener's attention on the text itself so they can hear its message, then you're just giving a lecture. You're not doing actual biblical preaching. Now that's my paraphrase of the article, but I really like it. It's a good article and, and preachers would do well to read it. There's a whole article on archaeological dating, how archaeologists actually go about dating these different finds, and a lot of discussion about pottery, one of the main ways archaeological sites are dated and different strata are distinguished from each other. Then there's an essay on biblical geography and archaeology. And then there's the one on inscriptions, coins, and papyri. There's a short history of archaeology in the Near East. And there's some pretty cool facts in here that I learned. I had no idea. Like one of the people who helped map a lot of the sites in the Holy Land was T.E. Lawrence. Lawrence of Arabia, like the guy from the movie. And a guy named Max Malawan did a lot of work in the Middle East and Iraq and Nineveh and those things. Uh, he had a wife named Agatha Christie, the author. Very interesting. After that, there's a glossary of archaeological terms, then about a four-page bibliography, an uh, index of all of the sidebar articles, so all the little articles sprinkled throughout the text, an index of all the maps, and there are a lot of maps found, smaller maps, in addition to the color maps at the back, and then at the end, the ESV concordance. And then lastly, there's the table of weights and measures, which is standard in most study Bibles, a list of the kings of Israel and Judah, and then a three-page, more in-depth timeline of the events in world history, Egyptian history, Palestine history, and then Mesopotamian history in the third column, and then the maps. So when we come to Genesis, all of the contributors come from a conservative, reformed, evangelical perspective. So when you're reading about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they are going to assume things like primary mosaic authorship rather than a more mainline documentary theory approach. Generally, the books of the Torah date from around the time that they claim to be written. This is not going to give you interpretation notes. They're actually very sparse on notes that tell you what the text means. The notes you get in here, especially in Genesis and especially in the early chapters of Genesis, you get a heavy emphasis 
on comparing Genesis with other ancient Near East accounts. And that's a great thing. If you've listened to the Disciple Dojo podcast series that we do on the first 11 chapters of Genesis, we go into a lot of that, and it's really good to see that covered in these notes. So there is a lot of discussion about other Mesopotamian creation accounts, other flood accounts. There's no scientific discussion of questions like the age of the earth, the extent of the flood, what time period people lived in. Instead, you get articles that introduce you to and explain things like the finds at Mari or Nuzi or the Amarna letters. When we come to Exodus, they are very good about not taking a dogmatic approach on a number of things. So the date of the Exodus, they give an article at the beginning that talks about both views that either the 13th century or the 15th century BC, they give a overview of each and then their conclusion is either is acceptable. Nothing hinges on one or the other that's absolutely crucial. Both are possible, both have strengths, both have weaknesses or areas where they're open to challenge. There's good discussion throughout about the plagues and how they were a polemic against the various gods and the various folk beliefs in Egypt. When it comes to the location of the Red Sea, we've looked at how different study Bibles treat that because it is there's still question. Unlike some of the study Bibles we've seen from Zondervan or other publishers, this one mentions that some people associate Yamsuf with the these bitter lakes or these marshy bodies of water up in closer to the Mediterranean in the Nile Delta, but they correctly note that the only unambiguous mentions of Yom Suf in the actual biblical text, like Jeremiah 49, 21, 1 Kings 9, 26, those both refer to what we know of as the Red Sea. And they say either the Gulf of Suez or the Gulf of Aqaba. Now, interestingly, both of those references are to Aqaba. I don't know of one that unambiguously references what we would call the Gulf of Suez. So that might just be their way of kind of holding to that traditional view. I'm not sure. But they do note that the place names all throughout the Exodus, like Pihiroth or Baal Zephon, they're unknown. And so anytime you see on a map, they're just guesses. They're just, I mean, they may be educated guesses, but ultimately they're, at the end of the day, they're not certain locations. When they talked about the route of the Exodus in both of the map sections, both the small map here in Exodus and the large map, if you look closely, they kind of take the traditional route that leads down here to the traditional site. Interestingly, when they're noting the other possible routes, they actually note, and I've highlighted it in yellow, another possible route that takes you right down to Aqaba. This is the one I think is right. But other than a very, very brief one sentence mention of it, they don't go into more detail. This is an area where the archaeological study Bible does a much better job in presenting the different views of the Exodus. You have like five whole pages of different proposed routes, including the one I like, background and discussion. And so you get a really full presentation. In the archeology span study Bible, you just get one page and they lean pretty heavily towards one particular view. However, unlike the archeological span study Bible, the archeology span study Bible has really good illustrations, drawn illustrations of the implements surrounding the tabernacle and the priesthood and everything that's described, including a big, illustration of the whole functioning tabernacle itself. Very helpful in these later tedious chapters of Exodus. Now, when we come to Romans, there is a good opening two-page essay on the history of Rome in the first century, what the actual city of Rome was like that Paul was writing to. And they include discussions of things that are very important in helping us read and interpret Paul's letter. Things like Roman religions, like what, how people practice religion in Rome. There's an article in chapter one discussing sexuality and particularly the question of same-sex relationships. It's called homosexuality in the first century. And then an article about the presence of Jews in Rome, which is one of the main themes of the book of Romans, the conflict between Jewish believers in Jesus and Gentile believers in Jesus coming from a pagan Roman background and those two worlds kind of colliding when Nero had let the Jews back into Rome after Claudius had expelled them. So there's a lot of that discussion. Unfortunately, they don't really unpack it in the notes. There are literally no notes on Romans chapter 7. It goes right from notes on Romans chapter 6 to notes on Romans chapter 8. No discussion at all 
of Romans chapter 7, one of the most contentious passages in the entire book of Romans. That's unexpected. And then in Romans 9 through 11, all of the sections in discussing things like predestination and election and God's choice of Israel and all Israel will be saved, what does that mean? There's literally no discussion of the theological issues that the text raises. There is an article about olive trees, but it doesn't really connect to the olive tree image in Romans 11 that Paul's using. I mean, it just says Paul uses the image of an olive tree. See this article. And it's an article that tells you about how olive trees grow. There could have been a little better connection between the two, I think. When we come to Revelation, this study Bible, probably as good as any I've ever seen, does a great job of anchoring the text in the situation of the seven churches. That's something that gets overlooked in a lot of study Bibles. They rush to get into the apocalyptic details of Revelation, like kind of the exciting stuff of beasts and plagues and dragons and death and four horsemen and all that kind of stuff. They rush right past those first three chapters. Well, those first three chapters are crucial because that's who the book is written to primarily. So the Archaeology Study Bible does a really good job giving an introduction to each of these churches. First, it starts with a little description and a picture of Patmos, the island where John was writing from. Then it has a discussion of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, you know we always look at Laodicea and how study Bibles handle that passage. I gotta be honest, this was a lot of fun. The Archaeology Study Bible does something I've never seen a study Bible do before on the Laodicea passage, and I've never heard a commentary do this before either. So it's either super cutting edge or it's wrong. I don't know which because I'm not an archaeologist. It notes that the traditional reading of hot, cold, and lukewarm as talking about spiritually dead, kind of alive, or spiritually on fire, it notes that that's probably not true, which is good. That's correct. And it also notes that the imagery of hot and cold being good and lukewarm being bad comes from Laodicea's surroundings. But then they say, contrary to popular belief, the water system did not include hot water piped in from nearby site Hierapolis. But the civic water supply came from a cold spring five miles south of the city. The lukewarm water imagery in Revelation is probably a reference to the contrasting hot springs and the snow-capped mountains nearby. You are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. This phrase is often interpreted as a reference to the city's water system. Hierapolis to the north featured thermal hot springs, but this water was never piped to Laodicea. Neither was potable water taken from nearby rivers. Instead, Laodicea's drinking water was brought from underground springs approximately five miles to the south via a siphon and aqueduct system. Laodicea sat in a valley surrounded by snow-capped peaks for much of the year. Snowmelt supplied cold water to the area's streams and snow was also used to chill wine and other beverages. Laodicea's setting between white travertines of Hierapolis's thermal springs and nearby snow-covered mountains most likely accounts for the neither hot nor cold imagery used here. This is the first time I've ever seen a commentator or a study Bible suggest that Laodicea did not get their water from Hierapolis. They are saying that that probably provided the imagery because the hot springs, thermal springs at Hierapolis, you can see them from miles away, but they actually go against most, almost every interpreter that I've come across on Revelation by saying, but that water never got to Laodicea. Archaeological study Bible disagrees. They say that the water did come from Hierapolis. So these two should just have like a big anchorman news team fight and decide who wins. That's the only fair way to settle this question. Now, when we get to the millennium in Revelation 20, there's no discussion whatsoever. That's surprising. There's no mention of the millennium. There's no discussion of how different interpretive schools have approached it. Nothing. That was just weird, I thought. Some other observations in 1 Samuel. There's no comment at all about Goliath's height, nor what archaeological or ancient finds have helped us piece together. The footnote does give the more likely correct four cubits in a span measurement, but there's no discussion in the notes themselves about why the Hebrew text would say six cubits in a span, which is over nine feet tall, and the Greek Septuagint, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and Josephus all say four cubits in a span. That's a little disappointing, but to make up for it, there is a cool picture of what sling stones would have looked like and how big they were. I have one here that I got from the Valley of Elah. I mean, these things are big, so imagine this smacking somebody knocking him down. That was really cool because in all the cartoons and stuff, you know, it's like a little pebble and David, boom, he slings it and, and Goliath blood everywhere. But in reality, sling stones were used for knocking down city walls. 
So these are like heavy artillery, and that's really cool to see an actual picture of. Lastly, I'll mention this. We don't, usually don't look at this book in these Bible reviews, but they do great with the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon, it's all poetry. It's all visual love poetry with erotic overtones, no matter what your Sunday school teacher or rabbi may tell you. And they do good in giving images so you can see pomegranates. You can see beauty accessories in the ancient world that would have been considered attractive. And then there's like two full pages on the different plants that are mentioned and the perfumes and the images that are used throughout the song. That's really helpful in interpreting the Song of Solomon. If you want to go into more detail about that, click on the Disciple Dojo podcast here and search for the episode called Hot Bible Sex. And it's all about the Song of Solomon and it is exactly what the title says. Do I recommend the Archaeology Study Bible? This is a tricky one. If they had not said what they said in the introduction about this being meant to be a supplement to the ESV Study Bible, then I would not recommend this as a study Bible because it's just too incomplete in terms of what a good overall study Bible should be. There, there are too few notes that actually help you understand the text, but that wasn't their intention. And they were upfront about that. And they said, nope, this is for helping you understand how archaeology influences the text. And so with that caveat, then I can see what they're trying to do. And this does a great job of what they're trying to do. So if you don't have a primary study Bible, but you are interested in archaeology, I'm still going to go with Zondervan with the archaeological study Bible as a better overall study Bible. But if you already have a primary study Bible and you are like hardcore ESV or you're ESV only or you're whatever, you just really want something in the ESV, this is a good thing to have on the shelf. For what it is, it is a very good resource. Crossway, I give you props. But for an overall study Bible that should be kind of your go-to, no, I wouldn't recommend it. I recommend this as a shelf resource that you use when you're studying a passage in more detail. Those are my thoughts, as always. Tell me what you think about it. Did I rile up any rabid Crossway fans out there? Probably. But that's what the comment sections are for. So shoot back. Give me your thoughts. I, I do, you know, thumbs up, uh, B, B plus. It's a good resource. If you have any study Bibles you'd like to see us review here at Disciple Dojo, please let me know in the comments below. And if you haven't already, please subscribe. We are trying to build this audience and build this channel and we need you. So subscribe, click the like button. That helps us bump up in the YouTube algorithms and then share this video with somebody. Tell other Bible nerds out there about this playlist. That's it. Have a great day, week, until whenever I do the next one of these. We'll see you then.